and welcome to Best Girl Speaks. Today is February 14th, and this is episode 239. I'm your hostess, Amy Beth, also known as the Fat Squirrel on Ravelry, and the Fat S-Q-R-R-L on Instagram. I hope you're doing well. You may hear, I don't know if you'll be able to hear the wind. It's super crazy windy last night and today. Our bird feeders are like, we had a downy woodpecker this morning. It's very exciting. He came back this afternoon too, and the starling chased him off. Starlings! <laughs> but I was super excited. We've not had, we had, we have, during a snowstorm a few weeks ago, we had a full, like a peleated woodpecker. Right? What? Huh? No, we totally had a peleated woodpecker that landed on our garage, but did not come anywhere near the the wood the the food. I don't know what was happening. I don't know if it was just like he was like, "Whoa, too windy, you gotta settle down." But he was only there for like a minute, and they flew away. Right? The world is random. What were we talking about? I think I was just saying hi. <laughs> So this week's episode is going to contain lots of fruit. I'm not kidding. It's going to, it's just the shenanigans of fruit. I think that's what we have. Shenanigans of fruit. You're not going to be sad. Don't worry. Um, and then we're going to do some spinning and knitting and then I'll say goodbye. Right? Um, so let's get into it. Okay. So first things first. I'm sure you've seen this, but just in case you haven't, I feel like as Apple to, Apple ambassador, it is my job to make sure that you are aware of this phenomenon that was reported during a recent snowstorm. Okay, why are you, why are you, I don't want you to show that, but whatever, it's okay. Have you seen the ghost apples? Right. This is a legit thing. You can Google ghost apple. It was picked up by the Detroit News. Happened in Western Michigan. So what happened is they still had some apples on the tree, the trees. I think he said these were Jonna Golds, um, or now that he's calling them Jonna Ghosts. Um, and what happened is as the ice storm happened, the, the apple of course gets coated in the ice, but the bottom wasn't, because of course as the ice falls, the bottom is not as thick as it is on the top. And so the, the apple that was there just like, like got gooky and gross. It just dripped out the bottom and left its like ghosty ice shell. How exciting is that? I was pretty excited. Okay, so now I'm, I'm feeling like maybe you're not as excited as I am, and that's okay. But you do need to get excited for this. Have you seen these? Now, other people know about these, but I did not know about these at all. This is the first time I've seen them. Now that doesn't mean that's the first time we've had them in our grocery stores, but like how disappointing is citrus? Like it has so much potential. Like you get a box of the cuties, the little, the little clementines and you eat them and they're amazing. And you try not to eat 12 in a day and maybe you turn a little bit orange, but you don't catch a cold forever. And they're delicious and amazing and good. And then you're like so excited to get your next box. And then you take one bite of it and you're like, ah, oh, disappointment. And like all of them in that box are totally disappointing. And so only like two out of three boxes or bags of them that you buy are delicious, which is not terrible. And I understand it's a natural product and like therefore it's gonna be slightly inconsistent. It is not in fact a fast food chain. It's not designed to be like completely across the board, but like, come on, this is like a huge variation. This is like delicious, awful, delicious, awful. Like I'm okay with delicious and eh, not so delicious, but still good. Good, delicious, but not delicious, awful. What's that? Why is there no in between Clementines? What are you doing? Get your act again. So, I saw the, and so, and then let's not even talk about regular oranges. I hear good things about the Cara Cara, 
I hear good things about the blood oranges, but I'm just, I'm, uh, my heart is heavy about the oranges. They are not Little House on the Prairie Christmas stocking oranges. They are, they're okay. Even my friends in Florida are like, yeah, no, I gave up on citrus. They're in Florida. What? But so when I saw these at the grocery store, I was like, that's a weird looking fruit. I bet it's delicious. Because you know, grocery stores are only like, no, we can only can, we can only carry the most orange of oranges that are plasticky and then we put them in an orange bag so that they look even oranger. And like, they can have no lumps and they must be shiny. And so I was like, this is actually an attractive one. Some of them are even weirder looking than this. I was like, I saw this and I was like, hmm. Slightly less than perfectly eating fruit, you intrigue me. Now that is not to say this is a pure perfectly eating fruit, but like there's, you know what I mean. It's got a lump on it. And when you pick it up, it feels like it's weird. Like it feels like the skin is not completely attached to the fruit underneath. And so you're like, is that okay? Is that legit? And they're not super cheap. Like these were on sale for $1.99 a pound, but our Whole Foods, I think they were three fifty. And I hear different prices from other people, like three ninety nine dollars all over the board. And they're, they're kind of heavy. So I priced ours out and these are like a dollar 20 a piece. So they're not cheap. So you're like, oh, I bought two. They're the best y'all. I cut it in half because like, I didn't know it was going to be amazing. But what you do is you can literally just like, and then you can hand peel this orange. What? Do you see me? Do you see me doing this? Look, it just comes off. What? Do you... That's a satisfying sound, right? The whole thing just comes off. It's oranginess. What? Some of you have had these are like, whatever. I'm gonna be honest with you, I brought them to game night. And was totally a big giant nerd. And I think other people were like, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> I'm still really in love with them. Like, look at that. Do you see how juicy it is? The pulp is even like coming off of the dang thing. So these are called Sumos. Now I don't know that that's like the brand that's just like the distributor's brand or whatever, but these are called Sumo Citrus. And apparently they only, oh, come on camera. Don't, don't mess with me. Apparently they only come out for like two to four weeks a year. And so part of me was like, I'm not even telling anybody that these are delicious because I want the price to stay low in my area. I won't, I won't lie. I thought about it but my civic mindedness weighed out because they're so delicious. So I definitely did not buy 15. I tried to, and then when other people confirmed that in fact they do have a very high like rate of goodness across the board and really, okay, the game, one I checked at game night was not the best one I've had. I should have really taken two and then like made sure one of them was the most delicious, but whatever. But like even that one that again was not the most delicious was still really good. So again, delicious, pretty good. I haven't even got down to good yet. And I we've had maybe 10 of them. <laughs> They're delicious. So anyway, I just feel like you should know. Because they're really good. And if you see one and you're like, If it's not, maybe just eat beans one night because they're that good. Okay, now, now other things. <laughs> if you're new to the podcast, this is exactly how it always goes. <laughs> I will pretend. So, sorry for the lighting change. The glasses change, I just realized. Oops. Um, but I recorded my book recommendation yesterday and when I was editing it, it was just not... 
wasn't good. Um, so I've decided to go ahead and re-record it this morning, so that's why the lighting is different, all that. Um, I definitely wore the same clothes today for continuity, and not because I wear the same clothes two days in a row. So I just finished listening to um, a book called Waking Up White and Finding Myself in the Story of Race, which is a book written and narrated by Debbie Irving. Did I say that I listened? I listened to this version. Um, and so this is from the author. She says, writing the book was not only my way to reach out to other white people confused and are curious about racism. It was like writing a five year long journal entry in an effort to make sense of all that I learned and experienced in my research. So my natural comparison to this book is White Fragility by Robin D'Angelo, um, which I just, I read a few weeks ago. Um, and so they kind of cover, I mean, they, they're basically about, they're basically both written primarily for white audiences, um, talking about race and um, its effects on um, folks, all the folks in our society. Um, but this one, as opposed to Robin D'Angelo's work, which has a much more academic voice, um, which had footnotes, which had academic language, um, this one is much more of a, it's not a memoir, but it has more of a memoir field. Now, both of them are feel, excuse me, both of them definitely relate real life experiences. But for example, a lot of the Robin D'Angelo experiences are gleaned from workshops where she's the instructor, whereas many of um, Debbie Irving's anecdotes are gleaned from workshops where she was a participant. Does that, so it gives you a, a much a perhaps more entry level um, footing into or entry level into the subject. Um, the author's voice is very strong in the book, in terms, you know, because it's presented um, not again not with that that barrier of academia. Um, so that can be a challenge, I think, for some folks. Um, it would normally have been a challenge for me in terms of her voice is very. Um, self-proclaimed wasp of money, um, country clubs and summer homes and things like that. And sometimes that can really be a barrier to me, but the author is very humble and very acknowledging of that. And because of that, I never was left questioning her perspective, her, like how she was processing the information. And so it felt authentic to me, um, and was not a barrier to me moving through the text. Um, but I found it to be really engaging. It not only gave me what I expected, um, for example, it didn't just give me, you know, her take on unconscious bias or instances where that affected her interactions with other folks in her life. It didn't just um, give me more information on specific topics like redlining, um, the Federal Housing Administration's districting of American cities that happened in, was it like the... I apologize, I'm not sure if it was post-war or pre-war, um, but the basically divided lots of cities up by class line or by race lines and then devalued properties based on how white a neighborhood was or how not white a neighborhood was. And then that in turn affected interest rates on those areas, which then spurned later growth in some areas and then less growth at others because if interest rates are a lot higher in a certain area, you're not going to build a grocery store there. Um, it gave me more information about how the GI Bill was a tailwind for lots of white post-war Americans, uh, but did not offer the same benefits to folks of other races. Um, so that was kind of what I expected from the text and was well done. Uh, but what I was surprised by um, was, I don't know what the term for it is, but it would basically be like, what toxic masculinity is to feminism is this thing to anti-racism. So it gave me a lot to chew on in the realm of how the overculture is affecting my values, is affecting the way I am living my life within it. Um, for example, like it kind of brought me back to, I read, um, like it was like a meme. It was like a photograph uh, on Instagram of, um, it was called so love letters to socialism or socialism, love letters or something like that. And it was a very simple white background that said, you are worth more than your productivity or something like it. 
Um, and that has, that has weighed have like every once in a while I kind of revisit that thought and it's, it's a very heavy thought for me. Um, because I do think that I have just unconsciously for a very long time completely put all of my value in productivity. Whether that is making meals for a family, whether that is using all of my time very effectively by knitting things that I definitely need, or, um, you know, any number of ways that that kind of gets, or, or like having my self-worth, um, affected by how other people see my career. Um, so again, this, 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 and again, it was not like a primary point of the pivot point of the book or anything like that, but this, this questioning of the kind of Anglo Puritan capitalist overculture and how those values, um, affect how I perceived certain traits in other folks was very interesting, not just as a person who is, I feel like I'm at a point in my life where I am trying to um, I'm past that survival mode and into more of a self-reflective mode. Um, so that was not only powerful for me, but powerful me, for me as a parent and really looking at how I react to my own child's um, pushback against that overculture in terms of it, it, my, my, knee-jerk need to just silence any sort of emotional disruption or um like toxic positivity right like somebody like a child tells you something that's very upsetting to them and from your perspective it doesn't feel like a big thing because you've already obviously already moved through that point and so the tendency is to be like oh honey it's gonna be okay everything is all right you know it's this, you know this like sugary stuff that we pour on that is not helpful. Like if you look back, that was not helpful when people did that for you, but it is just that knee jerk reaction because that's the water we're swimming in. Um, and so to try to, to, to just pull back that immediate response, um, and again, try to find the place, you know, where I, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> as a parent, um, where you're again, just trying to figure out like, okay, do I teach my child to never cry in public? Because that is seen as weak. That is seen as overly emotive. That's awkward. It makes people uncomfortable or, and so that can affect her success. That can affect her ability to have relationships. Or do I teach her that that is what other people expect, but that's not what you have to do. Or you know, where is that place? So that was something that was surprising to me about the book and what I took away from it. Um, so that's why I just wanted to recommend it to folks. Um, it's a great counter to White Fragility. If you did start to read that book and felt like the, the academic voice was too much, was too distancing, um, I do think this is a great alternative to it um, if that's what you're looking for. And so then in games, um, we've been, I've, well, I shouldn't say we, I've been playing Wingspan more, which is a game I talked very briefly about, I think last time. Um, but I've played it twice on the, there's like an Atoma, what do they call it? Atoma? There's like an AI opponent that you can play as a single player. And it's very clever. I really enjoy it. And I hope that other board games are able to um, adopt just that. And it seems like it is actually from a different company, like in a company that might actually independently develop these AIs for board games. It was really interesting and I look forward to seeing more of that. Um, but in, in virtual board games, <laughs> I've been playing Isle of Sky quite a bit. Um, and Isle of Sky is like a tile laying game. Um, like Carcassonne, um, I can't think of anything else right now, but there are a million of them. But it's a tiling game. It has a um, bidding component, so there is bidding involved with it. Uh, but it's not a, it's not, it is a, a large part of it. It's not like a, it's not just bidding. Like there's multiple things going on. Um, it looks like this. And so this is a game that we do have the paper version of, but I gotta be say, I, I can never, I can't convince anybody to play with me. 
So I'm very glad that there's this digital version of it, and I really enjoy it. And I do. It is a pay for. I'm. I know that it's less than five dollars, but I'm not sure exactly sure how much it is. Um, but I have been really enjoying it. Um, so just thought I would mention that one. Mm -hmm. And then it's spinning! Yay! I have two finished spinnings. Um, I finished this Coriadale from Knitspin Farm. So this was, um, I think four ounces of Coriadale. <laughs> and this is a three ply. This is, oh, I don't know what colorway it is, but it's about 300 yards. So I'm excited to use this as sock yarn. Really need to get my sock game in order. I'm knitting this Pebbles and Pathways socks and they are so gorgeous, but I just am like, I'll show you in a minute why I'm not gotten as much progress done with them. But anyway, so that is a traditional three ply. I really dig it. It's probably like sport to DK. I think it's sport, but it should be socks. And then I finished this little, little bit of um, hobbledy hoy battling. So this is only like two, yeah, 2.2 .2 ounces. And it's about 220 yards. And this is her cliffhanger colorway. So there's just little nuggets of bats that you can mix up and do whatever you want to. Sometimes I've chain plied them, uh, but this is just a traditional two ply. I just did half and half. And yeah. So they're really fun. And this feel, this yarn feels really great. It's nice and squishy. So eventually I'm going to start my Marl Mania card again, and that's going to be good. So I am like really having sweater glut. Like I am just want to knit every sweater all the time. Crazy time. I wanted the Guthrie, I want to the Marled Mania. Um, soft sweater has an old pattern, which I've never seen before, called like the Lovable. And it's like an Aran weight, but lace, which normally I'd be like, but then I've been seeing all these fat chicks with, okay, not all these fat chicks, like two fat chicks, whatever. Two fat chicks with cropped sweaters, and they are so cute. Like, either with like a high-waisted trouser, or in my case, a house dress. Or like that Guthrie skirt from So Liberated, which just looks like it's high-waisted. And it has like those giant pockets that you can put a ball of yarn in. So now I'm like, oh, I wanted it that stupid thing. And it's air and weight and lace. So I'm pretty sure and if I make it cropped, it's going to take like 10 minutes, right? Totally. So I'm going to make that to wear my house dresses. Oh my gosh. I don't know that I'm toddler grandma style, but I'm something. <laughs> oh, by the way, I totally forgot. You can't really see that. This is my, um, what's this sweater called? I knew it earlier. But then I just said all those sweater names and I forgot. I'll put it in the show notes. I'll put it on, maybe I'll put it right here. Miranda. And this is peacefully worsted. I'm not showing you everything, but can I just discuss? It has a kangaroo pocket. So I'm going to put in here, sorry, it's gonna be like a double cut, uh, but I forgot to like record any sort of like segue-iness, um, but I'm going to put in here a finished object that I have actually sent out. Um, so I don't have it here to show you today. Um, but that is why there's the weird cut here. Um, and also I forgot to, to mention the yarn. I do have it at the bottom of the screen, but just in case you can't read it for whatever reason, um, the yarns I'm using are another crafty girl's, the vast, um, it's her alpaca sock base. And then I'm holding that double with a skein of Lion Brand mohair silk that's very orange. And then the the other the contrasting color is um, Madeline Tosh sock in the manor held double with Shibui Knits, whatever their, al their silk mohair blend is. I apologize, I can't think of what it is right now. Um, in a blue color as that's pretty much the same, slightly lighter in color than the manor. That's what you're going to see now. So here is my three color cashmere cowl that, as you can see, only has two colors. <coughs> I just omitted the section between these two that is like the third color pop. Um, but otherwise, it's pretty much the same, I think. I did one extra repeat of the lace pattern. 
and I think a few less stripes so that they wouldn't all be the same. Because in the pattern there's different thicknesses of the like sections. Um, and so when I took out that that um, that third color that had the really wide chunk, I think it threw off the proportions a little bit. So I just tried to kind of tinker with it a little bit. And so I made this one a little bit wider and this one a little bit narrower to try to help them be different widths. So here it is. You can see that there's linen on it. Um, yeah, I just really, it is so soft and so warm and yet super lightweight. So you can wear it either, you know, if you're like going to fill out the bird feeders, pump gas in your car, whatever. Um, or you can just wear it as a regular. I wear them lots of times when I'm sewing because Again, I can still have headphones on without it, like, because you know, hat and headphones are often difficult to mess with. Um, so I can have headphones on and it doesn't affect that, yet it keeps my neck and head warm. And so they're just all around. Good things. There's my timer. Sorry. I'm the worst. Um, so yeah, so I'm sending this off so I wanted to show it to you. I do, my ribbing is flipping a little bit. Maybe I should have done a little extra ribbing or made the bind off um, a little bit snugger. I used like every other extreme, like every other one I did extremely stretchy. So maybe I should have made it too flexy so it's to roll back a little bit, but you know, whatever, if it does, it's fine. It's not like it's a big deal. Hmm, okay, very pleased with it. So yay, it's gorgeous. So yeah, I'm like, yes, I want to make all of the sweaters. Um, I did revisit, this is my Ducat, which is a, by Kate Davies. And I'm knitting mine with night shades, which is from Harrisville Designs. This is the Insomnia colorway. So it's the black with a little bit of olive. Um, so this one is a DK weight. It's 250 yards for 100 grams. It's wool and spun. I think this is Rambouillet, right? Oh, Cormo. It's Cormo, I'm sorry. American Cormo and wool. And this yarn is delicioso. So Ducat is just, is just a crop sweater. It looks like that. Whoa, I can't do things. So I I started this actually quite a bit back, quite a while back. I got this yarn at Rhinebeck, but I put it down because it was dark stockinette and I just was not feeling it. So I really do want this finished object and I really do like this yarn, but I am not, it's just like a little bit like snoozeville, but I just need to get it in my head. Like it's, you just want a cross sweater. You know you do. So yeah, I know it looks like nothing because it's black and it's on tiny needles here. But this yarn is super delicious. I really do dig it quite a lot. <sighs> Harrisville. I'm telling you. Me and Harrisville. We're getting married. We're going to the chapel. And then the last thing I have to show you is my after party sweater, which is a uh, pattern by Astra Trolland. I'm, just, I'm sure I'm saying that wrong. I apologize. Um, and this is why I don't have more work done on my Pebbles and Pathway socks. Don't, it's not done. Don't get that excited. Sheesh. Way to ruin my surprise. <laughs> right? Okay, so that mushroom, where's the mushroom marker? You can't even see it. That mushroom marker is where I was when I finished the podcast last time. What? This is a giant sweater for a fat lady in fingering, maybe sport weight yarn. What? This is also why there are only shenanigans of fruit this week. <laughs> There's only audiobook and fruit shenanigans. What? I dig it. Now I switched up my accidentally, I carried my yarn in the opposite hands for like this much and you can definitely see that a guitar comment there. I think it is anyway. It's not terrible. I'm not like, oh my god. It's not like that, but I'm like, I see like a 3% difference. Um, but I dig it. 
right now things I am doing I, I do not recommend this pattern for a beginner not because it's a poorly written pattern or anything but just because like it is not enough information there is no information like you get a bust you might get a hip measurement there's no arm scythe information and as a fat lady that is very important to know your arm scythe depth because unfortunately like old school and a lot of designers like Isolde have um, grown in how they write their patterns but many traditional or older patterns and and lots of new ones um, write to get a sweater big enough around they make the arm side like 25% larger than it needs to be minimum like you know you've had a yoke sweater where it was like, <laughs> like down to below your bra line for the armpit and not like in an intentional way <laughs> <laughs> not like these new sweaters um, that have that on purpose. Like, no, that was not what you were going for. The, moder the model picture had a normal looking arm scythe, but yours is basically to your waist. Like your boobs are falling into your armhole. It's terrible. It's like that. So I don't know. I didn't guess I could just do math. You just add up all the rows and see how deep it is. But that sounds ridiculous. I would rather just worry about it a lot. So just don't judge me. Shush. <laughs> but what I am doing, since I don't know the arm side of death, and since I anticipate that it's deeper than I need it to be, because it almost always is, um, there are more rows written between the, the um, color work sections, and I am not doing as many rows as is suggested for my size. A, aesthetically, I like the... F they're supposed to be, I think on my size, they're supposed to be like nine rows, maybe even 10 between the two pieces of color work. And these are four. I think I would, I don't know. I don't think I would like 10, especially since this one is only 14 rows deep. I feel like that would look weird. Um, and especially since this is very easy to continue. This is like just like a pepper pattern. In fact, I can really see how my tension got too tight on that. Usually my color work tension is looser, um, but when it's this every other row thing, it definitely tightens up. Um, but it's okay. It doesn't look too wonky, right? What was I saying? Especially since it's very easy to just continue this further because it's just peppered. It's not like it's, you know, something here where there's like a diamond involved that you would have to like, no, you just do this for a few more. So I think I did this for two extra rows and then just did fewer rows in between and I'll probably do that in other places because there's another checkerboard pattern um, and then there's another um, again just like kind of peppered pattern and they would be very easy to extend so I'm just kind of like from the way from the hip shooting from the hip we'll see how it goes the other reason I'm not freaked out about how tight this is compared um, is that there is a huge decrease in this excuse me, there's a four to three decrease. So four stitches to goes into three. And so I felt like if this tension was a little bit tighter, that would be okay. Cause it would kind of like ease that transition. I've not done enough yoked sweaters with that big of um, a stitch decrease lower down. Like I've had a pretty good, I've done top down sweaters that have like um, the Thrip More by Isol Teague has a pretty good, I think it might have a three to four increase, but it's like up here. So for some reason it makes me more stressed out to do it lower. Whatever. Just going with the program. Uh, but I felt like it would be okay if this was a little bit tighter because of that. Thought it help, would help that transition. But we'll see. I keep being like, does this look reasonable? Who can tell? I could take it off the needles and put it on, but shh, that would be logical. Just like counting the rows and figuring out how deep the arm size would be. So no, I will not. Thank you. Um, but that said, I am really digging it. So this is Bartlett Yarns in the terracotta colorway and then like some other colorway. They don't put tags on things. They're, they're cool like that. Oh, I really love it. I love the way it smells. I'm so excited. I love, I blocked one of the sleeves and I love how the sleeve looks after it's been blocked. Oh. Pretty delish, I'm not gonna lie. I 
am digging it. And I want to knit a million sweaters. It's silly. Even though I go nowhere to wear them. <laughs> but I still love them. I have to move to the far north. So I can wear a sweater all the days. Okay, I think that's all. <laughs> um, let's see, there was, if you're an iTunes viewer, there was a bonus episode about some sewing projects I did recently, so you can find that on YouTube. And there'll probably be another bonus episode in the next week. I don't know what that's gonna be about yet. If you have suggestions, please feel free to tell me. I would totally appreciate it. Okay, okay. And I'll talk to you next time. Bye.